welcome guys um new faces that i'm seeing today uh ahmed and priyanka welcome um so we're working on the book devops for data science which has um been really fun so far um i'm going to be presenting the first chapter of the book last week we did the um, introduction and if you guys haven't seen that video please go check it out um it really does a good job of like framing everything that we're going to be doing throughout this book um and i'm hoping that this won't take too long um because this uh this particular chapter um, isn't really super dense, um, but uh, all right, let's get started. Um, so uh, John's recommendation uh, from last week was to always start with these learning objectives, and I really, really liked that. Um, so the learning objectives here, uh, the main three are to describe the three environments used in software development and data science. Um, the second is to use GitHub Actions to deploy data science assets. And the third, you can see, is to keep environments in sync using infrastructure as code tooling. Um, so hopefully by the end of this, um, you having read the chapter and by the end of uh, us reviewing it in this uh, session, you'll be able to um, confidently say that you've uh, learned those three points. Okay, so... Um, I love memes. I think memes are just the best way to communicate um, little simple ideas like this. Um, and so I wanted to start with a meme that really encompasses exactly what we're talking about. Um, you don't want to be like Ken on the right. Um, you try to go and fix something and your entire product just goes down. Um, it's happened to me before, whether it's like an actual app that's running on a server, or if it's just like I sent an HTML to my PI and it's not like running on their machine. Like this is the kind of thing that we want to avoid. Um, users sad, supervisors mad, you know, you want to avoid that all the time. So code promotion is a concept that um, helps to avoid that. Um, I think that there, from the reading, I got that there are three main ways that code promotion does this. It's modul modularizing the um, processes that are going on, um, testing and checking rigorously, and minimizing downtime if something goes wrong. Um, so let's uh, really get into it and see what code promotion really looks like. Um, software development really wants to work with um, these three concepts of development, testing, and production environments. Um, the idea is that if you can separate out these uh, these three concepts and make sure that you're you know both uh, testing, integrating. Um, each of each little bit of code that you change at each stage, you're you're minimizing the risk of things going wrong. Um, and by the way, this all my images are sourced in the um, URL, so you can always go and follow those there. Um, so the first one, the development environment, you can think of this as the sandbox where you know, like it like it says in the book, most data science happens in the development environment. Um, we're talking your model model fitting and your plotting and you're making nice um, charts for people, investigating data, all the data science stuff that we're uh, mostly familiar with um, is happening in uh, what most companies would call a development environment. But uh, the book points out rightly that data science and software engineering are actually very, very different in the ways that they approach um, these environments. So when a data scientist is talking about dev, a software engineer is probably not talking about dev the same way. Um, so here I've just listed like just a nice little confusion matrix for you guys to hopefully appreciate this. So in data science, your goal in dev may be to explore relationships in the data, and that may or may not end up as something that goes on to be a product, whether it's like a, a shiny app or it might be some model that you're sending out and is integrated into your site or whatever. Um, data science, like we're kind of familiar with this. It's more about exploring data. Um, but with software engineering, software engineers kind of already know what they want to build. They already are pretty familiar with um, where they're going, what's necessary, what's required, um, when it's gonna be done. It's a lot less exploratory. And um, in the book, the, the analogy that they gave was that uh, it's like the difference between um, an architect and um, an engineer kind of like, you know, with, with an architect, they're kind of, you know, they know exactly what they have in their head. Like they have an idea and they're just trying to like put things around it. But an engineer, they have their requirements. They have the specs. Um, they're just going to say, okay, well, I need 
parts one, two, and three to do it, and I'm going to do it. So what ends up happening is that the tools that we use for, for dev actually look quite different. Um, for somebody like um, us guys in this group who use R, you know, when we're looking for dev tools, we're looking for these fully fledged uh, data science IDEs like R Studio and VS Code. But what ends up happening is that that can actually encompass everything of what we think of the uh, software environment. Um, with software engineering, it's very different. Um, you know, they think of dev, test, and prod as like completely separate things. They might be doing dev um, entirely in VS Code, and then test might be entirely dedicated to something like Circle CI or uh, what we're going to talk about later on. Um, and again, this meme really encompasses exactly what I've been talking about. Um, the data scientist, you know, pr produces a really fun notebook and says, when can I send it to production? And then uh, the um, <laughs> operations people are like that, you, you don't send a notebook to, to production. That's not how it works. <laughs> so hopefully the rest of this book is going to help us bridge this gap between the data scientists and the ML ops engineers. Um, the test environment um, is pretty self-explanatory, right? Test is for testing. And uh, at this point, if you're not um, writing tests, then the only thing I can say is learn to write tests. Um, I don't test all of my code and I kick myself because of it, because when I come back to that piece of code next week, I have to change something and it breaks. You gotta write your tests because at least then you'll know um, uh, exactly where things are breaking and how to uh, really get to the meat of the problem when they do break. Um, so the book specifically uh, mentions things like security, portability, performance, usability for as reasons for testing. Um, for me, my personal favorite is actually sanctity of mind because then at least I know um, that when something breaks, I can find where it is a lot easier. Um, and lastly, prod. Uh, production environment. This is the gold standard. This is where your product lives in the wild, quote unquote. Um, and for this can look very different for different companies and for different reasons. Um, but the book specifically recommends um, that you guard prod with uh, what's called continuous integration or continuous deployment tools, um, which we're going to get to in the next uh, next page. Um, but what that really is to accomplish is that we want to have a system that requires as little hands-on um, fiddling with code before it goes live. And that's what continuous integration and continuous deployment really, really want to accomplish. Before you go on, oh, yeah. or I guess it, it kind of covers both of these, but I I have a an ongoing conversation with Alex about the fact that his uh, book repository has, he goes from dev to prod he i mean he has like transient testing in uh -huh. the form of pull requests but he doesn't formally have a dev environment like he recommends and yeah. he was like oh huh and so he he's possibly going to be adding some stuff about like okay what where is that line like when should you know if you're doing some sort of live dashboard you yeah. probably want a formal dev where you see the dashboard deployed make sure it works and then you deploy that up to production after that. Right. Um, but for something like this, it's like, okay, the PR uh, passed or the, the PR tests worked, we'll merge it in. We have things in the book sometimes where tests pass and then we merge mm -hmm. it in and it doesn't look how we think it's going to look because we don't actually look at the book, you know, yeah. just make sure it works. Yeah. Um, and so it is interesting that like, you know, th there are these three things and they always should exist except when they don't. <laughs> right. <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I mean, I, I think that it's something that's been been on my mind ever since I took interest in this more um, formal idea of DevOps and data science, because I, I, I often think about how how easy it would be or how hard it is to bridge the gap between, hi, I'm learning data science. Here's my notebook. And hi, I want to apply for a job. And, you know, the employer says, well, do you know anything about putting your data science into production? Um, and so I, I, I spend so much time thinking about that and have come to the personal conclusion that I think that I will do my best to always have these three ideas, even if it's as small as like one tiny test before I send the email, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think conceptually it's good to kind of like 
realize what these are for any situation because production can be an email you know exactly. <laughs> like literally just uh here's an answer to your question i did a bunch of dev work mm -hmm. i did mm -hmm. some sort of testing verification that i believe that work and then i email you um the uh, and that's production the production Versus, exactly <laughs> yeah like you know a model that's being served to millions of users that's also production like it's, exactly you know, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Very wide range. Yeah. So I'm hoping that uh, you know, <laughs> going through this book will help us close that gap. <laughs> okay, let's talk about continuous integration and continuous deployment. Um, I thought that it would be best to just start with the with the graphic, um, because talking about Git can get um a little messy if you can't visualize it. Um, so each of these little nodes here, if you guys are not familiar with Git, you can think of these as uh changes to code. So you have your um, app or your server or whatever um, data product that you that um, you're managing each time that you um, and the timeline is from left to right um, each time that you write some code that changes something um, these little nodes um, represent that change and you can see here the prod the this line of prod here just re represents the fact that the production environment over here on the left is stable and then over here some code changed and it's stable here and it's stable there um test environments this is where um you know most of your testing should happen in with uh continuous integration and continuous deployment right so if you make some code changes you pull you pull the production code um into test and then you write some features, you put it into tests, and then the CI CD will jump in. And if, if everything works, it's going to throw that code um, right to production without you having to interfere. Um, and so this is just one visualization of uh, how Git um, can be used to track changes in code and everything. There are so many um, philosophies and workflow patterns for Git. Um, you can actually get pretty lost in um, reading the pros and cons of them. So I'm going to leave that to you guys. Um, so how it actually works in practice. Oh, and, uh, one last thing to mention before I go to that is that, um, GitHub actions right now is, uh, supposed to be one of the leading, uh, um, providers for CI CD tools. There's also GitLab, which I'm learning is pretty, uh, common and frequent, frequently used. Um, but I've never used it. But if you're if you ever have a problem with GitHub, there are other options. Um, well, and it's go interesting ahead. Go ahead. that oh, um, GitHub Actions was introduced. I don't know, a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. I think it was right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it's hard time. Time doesn't work anymore. But you know, so three or four years ago, it feels like a yeah. couple of years. Um, and they, you know, like he talked about, like there used to be. Travis and Circle CI and you know all these different things and they still e exist, but GitHub Actions has just really taken over because a lot of people were already using with uh, GitHub, and so oh it's all in one place and they are fairly easy to work with. I mean, I don't know that easy is the right word, but like learnable. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, no, absolutely. You know? <laughs> I I was surprised how. Um how straightforward it was to just plop everything that we had in circle ci into github actions in one go i yeah. was pleasantly surprised and especially uh well not i'm sure lots of things are like this but within our there are a lot of projects or there is the a project to um, provide a lot of the types of actions that you might need and so mm -hmm. they have standard workflows that you can use to deploy a book for example or yeah uh, to deploy a shiny dashboard to shiny apps, things like that. Right. Um, yeah, no, it's fantastic. And um, welcome Federica joining the call. Oh yeah. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Um, so how, um, CI CD actually works in practice. Um, I remember using circle CI for many, many months without even understanding what it was doing. So it's very important. I think that we like just lay it out here. Um, the first step is that it builds a clean, empty server on the cloud. Like it just spins up something that's out there in the cloud and then copies your code with your new changes and the bare minimum required for it to run. Um, so you can think of this the same way as like, if you've ever used Docker 
um, it spins up a, a like a mini little computer up there. Um, or if you've you, if you've ever done um, uh, package development in R, um, it spins up like a tiny little environment for it to just load up the package and see if it runs. Um, same thing is happening with uh, CI CD. It's just the whole server is being put together. Um, and then if you've included any tests, which hopefully you have, um, it runs the tests in that uh, cloud server. And importantly, if the test fails, it just stops. There's nothing you should, you should expect things to fail before you start deploying stuff first. Like seeing your CircleCI um, or your GitHub Actions uh, fail is an expected part of development. Um, and then once you pause your tests, um, you know, your uh, CI CD tool will then accept the changes and then push it to production, whatever that might be. The simplest one, uh, like John was mentioning, this book is managed um, by uh, GitHub Actions. And this URL is the actual like production um, environment for it. And as John mentioned, uh, Rlib is a great package for working with uh, GitHub Actions. Um, the link is right here. Um, and you can check that out for um, if you've ever used package development, there's a function that just says spin up rlib for this package and package down. Um, so that the code that actually does that, you can actually investigate that here. Um, OK, so one thing that's important to um, think about is that when you send your code to your CI CD tool, um, it's going to spin up the server, but the server itself has many forms that it can take, right? So you can imagine that if somebody wants to run your R code on a Windows machine versus a Linux machine versus a Mac, um, there are all sorts of like configurations and different versions that your like underlying server can have, right? So um, CI CD is uh, really great for uh, actually testing all of these different forms. Um, fortunately, like I said before, um, Rlib and uh, uh, GitHub Actions have enough configuration that you can test many of the most common cases, use cases, like different R versions and stuff like that. But um, if you get more into it, um, the config package in R is recommended. Um, you can use that to set environment variables so that your server can, um, so that your CI CD tool can uh, test against very many different um, environments. And uh, we're obviously not there yet, but when it comes to setting environments and things, um, I'm fairly sure that uh, chapter seven and chapter eight is, is where we're gonna start um, learning about that. So stay tuned. Um, so next, creating and maintaining an identical environment. So um, <laughs> I love this um, analogy um, that was used in the book, servers should be cattle. Um, and it reminded me of an analogy that um, my supervisor used to tell me, um, environments are pocket change. He used to tell me that if you are worried about, you know, destroying your uh, new shiny Conda environment or Pi and V or whatever that you're using, then you're worrying about dimes. You're worrying about pennies. Just, you know, keep moving, start a new one, build it up again. It's fine. Um, and what that really means is that servers should be unremarkable. Um, they should be used interchangeably, used frequently, um, because you want to get through, you want to do as much testing as, as you can, um, you know, reasonably do with the amount of time and the amount of resources that you have. So throw in as many uh, server uh, configurations as you want, you know, um, that way you're covering your bases. Um, Specifically, though, those different environments should be identical to the production that you expect your users to have. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to throw out tests for, you know, Windows 7 or something um, right now, because if somebody's using Windows 7, there's probably a specific reason they're still using Windows 7, and that's not your use case for your for your code, right? Um, but more importantly, um, when you're actually writing your tests, you shouldn't fiddle with the test environment um, because it means that if you if you tinker with things in test, the real production environment is not going to look like your tests when the tests pause. And this is a concept called um, alignment, software alignment, um, which I had never heard before, but makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, to deal with that, there are many infrastructure as code tools 
that are meant to manage uh, servers and changes. And you can think of these as similar to um, continuous integration and continuous deployment tools. Um, the same way how you can write some code that configures your GitHub actions. You can also write code that configures how the test server should uh, should look compared to the production server compared to your dev server and make sure that um, continuous pushing of, of code is going back and forth between those three. Um, I'm interested. Oh, go ahead. I'm interested to see um, what he gets into with that because like uh, let's say go with the book down example mm -hmm. that there is a um, a GitHub action that runs when we make a pull request and then there's a separate GitHub action that runs to actually deploy the book when you merge the pull request into main. And it is not set in stone that the environments that those build are the same. And so um, it's, I have had it where I, um, you know, some, I have to, uh, add some server or something to the environment and I only, accidentally only do it in the PR environment and then right. deploy it to main to production and it breaks. Yep. And so I wonder if there are tools to keep your GitHub actions, you know, like it must be possible to just set a stand, you know, a single thing that is where you're fiddling, you know, where you are making any necessary server changes, right? And have both of them load that. Um, and it, so, yeah, I'm interested to see what where we might go with there that <laughs> uh, probably yeah. next chapter. Yeah, hopefully in the next chapter, right? Yeah. Um, I'm really hoping that we get to see more of that. Um, and I was also thinking while I was, you know, doing background reading for uh, creating these slides. Um, these infrastructure as code tools, it, again, it goes to the um, to my previous point about how do we learn things that are really not built for us yet. Um, these infrastructure as code tools are like really high scale. Um, you know, these are what, you know, this is probably what GitHub is using for GitHub. <laughs> right. <know? laughs> like it's not, it's not going to be your everyday R user who's just trying to, you know, fit a model and do something for their homework kind of thing. Um, but fortunately, we have this book that we're going to uh, go through and uh, learn a lot more. So, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, it would be remiss of me to, to think poorly of myself because I've never seen the infrastructure as code. Um, it's because it's really for uh, big productions. Well, I mean, if you think about the header of a GitHub action workflow uh -huh. is infrastructure as code basically is telling yeah. it what uh, OS is to use and, you know, anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm, you know, like I say, I'm interested to see chapter two, because I think we're going to really get into that. And if it's not there, one of the things I do want to start doing is having a separate, you know, file that does the setup that all of them use. Because yeah. like I said, I've run into that before mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. oops, my production environment isn't the same as my test environment, just like, you know, which is the whole point of yeah. all this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, definitely looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's my time, a pretty short chapter. So um, I decided to just put in this really quick little review Ooh. table to make sure that we hit our objectives. Um, that's really good. I think I'm going to put that in the template. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I hope it's useful for everybody. Um, uh, so uh, specifically, we learned about dev, test, and prod, the differences, um, and why we would need to have these differences. Um, GitHub actions to deploy data science, um, science assets. Um, I mentioned the RLib package, super useful. Um, and then we also wanted to learn about infrastructure as code tooling. Um, and I think the lessons here are that servers are cheap. And you don't want your um, uh, your environments to drift away from each other. And uh, yeah, that's my time. Thank you guys for uh, being here and for <laughs> listening to me and for going on this book journey with us. Yeah, that was awesome. So um, I have I'm having the, um, just one question. Go ahead. Um, so we are um, we are dealing with infrastructure as a code. 
uh, I'm, I'm thinking of infrastructure as code uh, as a description of reproducible environment. So we write like some some kind of configuration YAML file, mm -hmm. and we said uh, we have instruction uh, steps in steps. You deploy with this kind of configuration to build an operating system in in a server. Yeah, and uh, there is a in cloud. Every cloud provider have its own uh, infrastructure as code tool, and um, to just like uh, AWS having like uh, cloud formation, and right. um, I don't know if Azure is having a, something, but um, the main the main thing that there is a there is a tool that used uh, like independent on the cloud provider, which called like uh, I know Terraform, uh, which is like uh, it's working with all like Google and Azure also and um, GitHub and also um, AWS. Yeah. So building building with this kind of tool are like independent on the cloud provider is very important because if if uh, if a company having like some kind of migration or uh, mm -hmm. trying to to move to another provider, this kind of tool will help them a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, it's, I, and I mean, like we're, we're kind of also in a bit of a moment of reckoning with, uh, with GitHub because, uh, when did they have their, their Microsoft takeover, maybe five or six years ago or something like that. And a lot of people were concerned. A lot of people were very, very scared that like, you know, everything that we've built that's automatically deploying, that's automatically fetching changes from GitHub. If Microsoft decides to just up their pricing or you know switch up their their um um their models a lot of people were like we have to make sure that our infrastructure as code is is going to be reliable so that if we have to switch over to something like we're not going to have to spend hours and hours clicking buttons but we can just mm -hmm. deploy the code and the infrastructure will already like stand itself up so it's super important to make sure that like you can you have those reproducible code environments um I, su I i agree thank you for bringing that up awesome. yeah i like i feel like i probably should put a repository on the gitlab at, at least once just to yeah. have done it because i you're right like i i'm totally reliant on github i know how to do all the things that work i know how to do a lot of things on github not everything still outside of github like i guess i've technically worked with um uh, Bitbucket way mm -hmm. back when the yeah. Atlassian one, but no, um, no CI CD on Bitbucket. I, I know it exists, but I haven't done it. Right. Uh, so yeah, like it, it's probably good to just try the other tools. Um, and you know, I've also worked with Amazon, but I haven't worked with uh, Google Cloud or um, Azure and stuff like Azure. that. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I mean, I, I barely worked with Google Cloud, I guess. Um, yeah, so any, all of that is a good point. And it's nice, like, it is really nice that GitHub Actions aren't Docker containers, but they're close. And so, like, right. the transition um, isn't as hard as it was 10 years ago. And hopefully in, you know, every year it gets a little easier, basically. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, any other questions, comments, or from uh, maybe Priyanka or Federica, if you guys have anything to add, um, you know, we're open ears here, but um, that's my time, really. Uh, I don't have much more to um, to say. Looking forward to reading the next chapter, though. Um, I think I have one other question. So yeah. um, in a development environment, I think we forget that we're already testing in the development uh, before uh, we go into testing environment, mm -hmm. and it depends on I think it depends on the company if it follows these rules like um, having uh, a development and testing and uh, production, because I I heard some some companies are having uh, a staging environment. I don't know if it's the same as testing or is this, is it uh, different. So do you know, uh, is it similar or not? That's a, yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, when I was trying to find images to, to, um, uh, to put in this, in these slides, I definitely did see many of them with, uh, dev 
testing, staging, and prod. Um, and my understanding, you know, maybe we should make sure that we get um, the author's word on this. My understanding mm -hmm. is that staging is where things go when they're not necessarily being tested um, because you have the test environment to run the different tests. Staging is where you go to make sure that it sort of like works in the wild, so to speak. So it's sort of like an alpha right. before it goes out. Um, but I'm not going to say more than that because that's the limit limitation of my understanding. For for um, the company I work at, I think our our staging is mostly like we don't do continuous deployment. We do scheduled releases, and so we have a staging environment where all the things that are going to be in the release get deployed together. Versus mm. the test environments before that might just be you know, the baseline plus the one feature that this team is working on. And so you want that step before production, that's exactly what will be going out to production um, with everything involved to make sure that mm -hmm. they don't break each other, basically. Um, I think that's one version of staging. Yeah. Um, Which I'm just going to make me think, yeah, so I just, I was just trying to, um, get get it clear in my head so it seems like you, you're doing unit testing at one one stage and then the staging one is actually integration testing yes. in a way you attend, yeah. You attend integration. yeah i mean we still are doing unit testing at all the stages because you want to make sure nothing you know you yeah. want to run your tests everywhere um and make sure that they don't break but that yeah. the um, the staging really sort of adds that integration testing in some in, form yes. of it. Yep. And that, you know, it, it makes sure that everything is really um, what's going to go. And then I think another version of that that sometimes people do is you set up what's effectively a test environment and you test it. And then if it passes, you swap over and that becomes the production environment. And then you kill the test environment or the old prod environment, basically. Ah. So. That's one way that you can do a staging. Like you, you've set it all up; it's ready to go. You mm -hmm. can have your testers go in and actually use it and make sure everything works how you think. And then, you know, a lot of uh, like AWS and all, all those types of tools, it's relatively straightforward to just flip a switch and okay, now that environment is production. Right. Um, so that's another way that that can happen. It is, you know, the lines aren't as clear as the, the three buckets. I mean, just like I said, like he doesn't really have a testing environment for the book. He mm -hmm. said he's probably gonna add one now because uh, he felt kind of called out by that. He's like, oh, I probably should have like another deployment of the book that isn't the main deployment of the book that each pull request will go to that deployment. Um, I just saw, um, was it our packages, which is under active uh, development right now, yeah. They do have a full deployment of the book that each time they do a pull request, it deploys to that place so they can look at it, make sure it, it works before they deploy it to the actual production version of the book. So, you know, I want to do that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at this, at this stage right now, I actually have a, like I'm, I'm submitting course materials as our packages um, and so I, I'm submitting it as package down and I'm telling my professor, you know, Hey, my homework is at this URL, but if I try and send my new assignment to the URL, I don't know when the professor is going to open it. Right. Like, <laughs> so I, I really want to have like a, a separate, you know, staging, <laughs> staging package I, down. <laughs> I, I have, I have done that. I don't religiously do that for some of the, um, R4DS stuff for the, uh, mentor dashboard and for the book club time mm -hmm. chooser i have in the past set it up where first i deploy to like an alternate url and then i deploy to the real url I, I need to i think by the end of this book i will make sure that i maybe by the end of next chapter i'll set it up to the prs actually deploy to the fake one so i can go look at it oh yeah because a lot of things like yeah i've got tests but you know it's testing login and it doesn't really test it like it tests that some artifacts look how that i expect them to look but that doesn't mean that the login worked you know mm -hmm. it means mm -hmm. that everything that i know to look for worked um but sometimes it'll be oops i don't actually like the cookie's not actually accessible and so yeah it didn't really work um 
yeah so super important. Uh, i'd love to see an example of that when you uh when you have the time uh, so jack's presenting next week but okay all right let's see it's not that busy of a week i'll try to have that set up so that we can talk about it next week <laughs> okay that would be fantastic <laughs> really appreciate all the work that you do here no problem all right um yeah i'm curious to know if you guys um is there a separation between testing code and testing data? <laughs> uh, so it, it, there's lots of different meanings for testing data, I think. Like some of that, a lot of testing data is kind of on the way into your code, checking, you know, validating that the data makes sense. Um, but I don't if your code, see a separation like... Um... Yeah. I don't see it in a tool or something that separate how we test data and how we test the code itself. But so, yeah, uh, that that is one of the things that makes testing it, that can make testing hard for data science is, you know, real data is weird and you never know. Like, mm -hmm. you don't. It's hard to always be sure that everything's going to work with the real data, like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's um, there are you can you can be sure that uh, the code it doesn't change, it changed because the data changed. So it's, uh, right, yeah, it's like <laughs> yeah, it's you know there are all the ones that are like um, how things get alphabetized changes by different uh, locales, which can suck in a lot of code. Like normal code can run into that. But it can make a huge difference in like data science work that yeah. the way that things are ordered could lead to a factor being different and therefore can lead to something totally breaking you know like and that's not something you would nor normally run into just because something's sorted in a different order so yeah yeah <laughs> separation is super important for um for data science versus software engineering because for software engineering like QA testing is in and of itself an entirely um, investigated field. You know, they've beaten QA to death. Like everybody knows a QA somewhere. Um, but for data science, you're right. Like the testing of your data is not, it's not something that we've investigated very much. Um, I think in my experience, I've, I've definitely come across what John mentioned and that, you know, you expect a piece of data to come in one way and it comes out another way, especially when you're working with um, user submitted data, text fields, you know, it's a it's a nightmare. Um, so I think writing to like, maybe that's something that we need to, you know, all invest some time in. Oh, and dates. Oh, don't ever give me an Excel file with dates. I'll send it right back to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I do know um i think it was in the uh q a that uh, the advanced R cohort had with hadley uh just this past week mm. that he talked about one of the things that they're doing is um like input validation in right. uh in the tidyverse right now they're trying to get better at checking what's coming in sooner because a lot of times it'll you know something's the wrong type and they'll do a whole bunch of calculations and then go oh crap this is the wrong thing right and it's I really mean, far downstream as well like you yeah and so then the that. error message is like incomprehensible because it's something mm -hmm. that was called by something that was called by something that was called by something and you don't you're like what what do you mean yeah yeah um and so they're working on trying to do to be better about that that's something that we've done a fair amount of at my uh my work that we try to test all the input inputs to make sure they look how we think they look mm -hmm. so we can you know error fast or um at least log it or yeah. possibly coerce it if it's like oh we expected that to be a number but okay in this one table it's a character but it's like just it's the string of the number so mm -hmm. just turn mm -hmm. it into the number things like that um because there are some functions that we'll see you know, two in quotes is nothing. It doesn't realize that that's the same thing as two without quotes. Um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, uh, all of that is definitely a whole other thing. Did, did, 
um, from your from your um, understanding of the conversation, did you, did they mention that they were developing something for users or just internally within the tidyverse? Uh, as far as I know, it's just internally that there's it, that is one of the projects that they are starting. I think gotcha. of putting more like they're doing a lot right now throughout the tidyverse on better error messaging, and so doing that data. Uh, that input validation is one way to get better error messaging because you can say right up front, this we expected mm -hmm. this to be a number and it's, uh, you know, it's whatever, it's a string. Um, yeah. So you can fix it right away. Um, but a lot of times, like if it's something they're going to be using in all of their packages, they'll probably develop it, you know, some standard way of doing it. And then it's available for you to use uh, yeah. outside of their packages yeah um so i'm i'm watching that to see what happens there and who knows maybe i totally misinterpreted what <laughs> they're doing but that was what i gathered <laughs> all right does anyone have any other comments questions i gotta say i i like the size like you know Three, three to six people is the perfect size for a book club because yeah, people actually speak up. That's mm -hmm. the, the secret mm -hmm. sauce. You need it to be small enough that people are comfortable talking to each other. Agreed. Um, so, um, so cool. I will see you all next week, I guess. Thanks so much, John. Oh, uh, there's the sign-up sheet pinned in the channel. We have the next one covered, and then we have two weeks off, and yeah. then... Uh, we need someone to sign up. So I'll bug people next week, but just letting you know that it's there. All right. Bye. Bye. See ya.